Good evening, everybody. Do you remember the Indian word that I taught you? Okay, how do you do? Oh, excellent. Excellent. One more time. Oh, this is my clip for you. Excellent. You all are now ordained to be missionaries to India. Please be seated. Are you all ready for the Lord? Yes. And are you all hungry for the Lord? Yes. Are you physically hungry or hungry for the Lord? No. You're not physically hungry. No. So which means you had a bite this afternoon. No. What about mouse, mouse bite? Ant bite? No. No bite at all? No. Oh, what glorious saints you all are. <laughs> this evening, before uh, this coming here, as I was praying, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared unto me. And I thought he was going to speak to me about this meeting. But he spoke to me about this nation. And he said, this is what you need to tell the people about this nation. And it chiefly, it concerns President Donald Trump. So this is what the Lord said. Surround the president with prayer. They need to organize a governmental prayer watch. I, I honestly don't understand that word. But I just wrote down whatever the Lord told me. Surround the president with prayer. Need to organize a governmental prayer watch. Pray he completes his full term. For that is the period of grace extended for this nation. His term should not be prematurely aborted. Witches have formed a prayer watch in the night hours to do sorcery and witchcraft over him. So if the witches can form a prayer watch, how much more the saints of God. That's about your president. Number two, the second thing is, a strong woman movement will arise in this nation. And that is why the Lord said he has asked us to do this conference. And when the woman rose up, I saw them with this triple anointing upon their lives. So in on one hand, they will have a sword in one hand, a tambourine in another hand, and a prayer incense arising from their mouth. Out of this prayer movement will be born an army of sons and daughters and youths for the kingdom of God. So this woman movement is very important. Just like you give birth to natural babies and then you bring up, nurture them and you bring up in a similar manner, you are going to give birth in the spirit to the children, the thoughtless and the youths. Finally, a word for all the pastors and the churches. Pastors, mend your ways and seek the face of God or else I will come with a rod to chastise and discipline. I will scatter those who scatter my people. So most importantly, please pray very much for your president. Now I remember when the Lord gave this word that last year 
I was in the Philippines to speak for a bishop's church uh, for their 33rd church anniversary. And uh, in a similar manner, the Lord gave me a word that they should set up a prayer watch for the president. And I saw dark clouds all surrounding the president that were going to cloud his judgment and also witchcraft been assigned against his life. And uh, in the past, the president of the Philippines has an infamous reputation for being very bad mouth. Have you heard about that in the papers, in the news? And just foul words come out of his mouth and all that. But after the church had organized a prayer watch for the president throughout the whole country of the Philippines, there came a marked change in the president. He stopped speaking bad words. He became transformed as a nice gentleman. So, prayer works. Right? So, there's power in prayer. When we pray, then heaven moves. In the same manner, I do not know what kind of assignments are against the President of the United States. But the little that I read in the papers tells me that situation is not good. You know better, right? You are the sons and the daughters of the soil. You know better. You know, till the day of the election, even Mr. Trump did not think he will win. Right? The whole, all the media in this nation were against him. And they were portraying for Mrs. Clinton to come to office. There was absolutely no hope for Mr. Trump to become the president. Even the polls were all showing the figures that Mrs. Clinton will come to office. That was the scenario in the natural. And then when the election results were announced by the end of the day, it was a big surprise for everybody, even for the Trump camp. They were shocked. So was Clinton. Both were shocked. <laughs> One was shocked they lost, another was shocked they won. You know, I used to ponder very much about that. If all the cards were stacked against them very highly and very strongly, and yet Mr. Trump won against all odds, is nothing but the hand of God. Amen. Amen. Amen? It's nothing but the hand of God. It was in this very place that I saw a vision in August, when we were here last year, where I was taken before the council in heaven, and I saw Abraham and Mr. Trump's spirit come and stand there, and he said, Mr. Trump will be the next president of the United States of America. This was decreed in heaven. So because it is decreed in heaven, he came to office against all odds. And the Bible says in Daniel chapter 2 that it is God who appoints kings. He sets up kingdoms and he pulls down kingdom. It is God who sets up. So because now he is God's man, like a Cyrus, that's how the word the Lord used, no? Cyrus. Now I'm going to show you something. Is it okay, everybody? Please turn your Bibles with me to the book of Daniel. Chapter 9. 
everybody ready you all have the old fashion bible or the digital bible digital bible then you just do flipping okay daniel chapter 9 verse 1 in the first year of darius the son of ahasuerus of the seed of the medes who was made king over the realm of the chaldeans number verse 3 and i set my face unto the lord god to seek by prayer and supplications with fastings and sackcloth and ashes in the first year of the reign of king darius the prophet daniel spent much time fasting and praying so the president trump is like darius i mean cyrus oh i'm sorry i read to you the wrong scripture please forgive me must be the hunger pangs <laughs> that's clouding the mind a little bit but you are all right you know you don't have that problem how wonderful okay sorry chapter 10 though it was a wrong chapter but the principle was there <laughs> the principle was also there but the king's name was wrong name but the principle was there you know okay chapter 10 verse 1 in the third year of cyrus king of persia a thing was revealed unto daniel whose name was called Beth- belteshazzar and the thing was true but the appointed time was long and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision and in those days i daniel was mourning three full weeks so during the reign of the king cyrus and we saw earlier the first year of darius during that two period the prophet daniel spent much time fasting and praying and those two period he was given powerful revelation in chapter 9 and chapter 10 concerning kingdoms that were going to come to pass <clears throat> so now mr trump is still in his first year right as he completed 100 days today oh how perfect see how prophetic isn't it i was in counting the days you know i i knelt down actually to pray for this evening's meeting when suddenly the lord came and he said this is the word i want you to tell the people about the president and this happened to be the 100th day and you know all over the world the first 100 days of a government is very closely scrutinized they either succeed or they fail in the first 100 days so on this 100th day of his presidency now comes the word so to pray much for him that he will complete complete his term so that it is not prematurely aborted by any forces if all the people of god in this nation pray you know whether you are a citizen or you are a green card holder or you are a resident as long as you are in this soil and you are benefited socially economically by this land then your duty bound to pray for those who are in leadership you cannot say i am a visitor i i'm not a citizen you can say that if you are working here you are studying here you are in a way blessed by this nation so if you are blessed by this nation you are obligated to bless this nation you may be a student this nation is giving you an education 
you are working here. This nation is supporting you financially because she's giving you money. Although you are working, she's giving you money, right? This is the two category from outside. Then the third category are the natural born sons and daughters of this nation. Whether you study or you don't study, whether you work or you don't work, you still get money, right? From the social security, how good your government is. Our governments don't give us a dime, you know. If you don't study, you don't work, no money. See, but how good is your government? Gives you a dole every month. Encourages you not to work. <laughs> Isn't it? See, there is good and there is bad. Okay, we will not stop, step into those political er arena. That's not my cup of tea. But the fact is this. You are duty bound. See, Prophet Daniel was taken to Babylon or Persia as a captive. But he succeeded and prospered in Babylon and he rose up to the highest office in the empire. He was just second to the king. And being in such a high office, he, he became like a naturalized citizen. Because we never read anywhere that he went back to Israel. Right? When he saw all those visions, he was quite an old man. He, Nehemiah went back, Ezra went back, Ezekiel went back. But you don't read about Daniel going back. I've always wondered why he didn't go back. So he was blessed by the land. And he prayed very much. See, God positioned him strategically in that nation to stay there, to pray there, and to be a prophetic voice. So God has raised you up in this nation or kept you here or brought you here so that you can add your tears into the bowl of incense for this nation. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your holy presence on this last day, on this final moments. You have been with us these past three days. And you called us, especially your daughters, to come and be apart unto you because you wanted to talk to them. You wanted to make a covenant with them. You wanted to make your ways known to them. And they have continued with you these past three days from morning till evening. Now I pray, Lord, that you will stretch out your hands and bless them more than what they ask or they think. Even more and beyond. Father, I know the heavens are open right now and are looking upon this conference. And the angels appointed for this last day's woman movement to arise. Those angels appointed to help them. They are also standing at the edge of the open heaven to see what is going to happen. And now I pray. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to open our hearts, open our ears, that we may hear what the Spirit of God is speaking to the churches in these last days. 
especially to all the dear daughters of God. I thank you, Holy Father. You know, I'm, while I'm praying this prayer, I see towards my right side, at the far corner of this church, some wonderful event. But let me ex explain it like this. During a university or a college convocation, all the diplomas are nicely rolled up and tied with a ribbon and they are stacked up like a pyramid on a plate ready to be distributed to the students. Likewise, I see on a light golden plate scrolls rolled up and tied with a red ribbon waiting to be given to you. And a mighty angel is standing there holding the plate in his hand waiting to distribute to those who are called to the eternal purposes of God. To all those whose names the Lord Jesus came on the first day to write. If you remember, I shared with you how I saw the Lord Jesus unfold a large scroll and your names are all written in the scroll according to the anointing that you are going to receive. I hear this angel now talking to another angel and he's saying, oh, I'm so excited to see what is going to happen very shortly. And I see on their faces a gleeful joy, a gleeful happiness, and a gleeful excitement. The great things that's going to happen to you shortly. And this angel is signifying to me more of their company will be arriving soon for each one of them who have been called, chosen, and ordained by God. And the ones that are going to come, they are bringing the weapons from heaven. I see sharp, sparkling swords that they are bringing. And some are bringing heavenly musical instruments. And some are bringing scrolls. But these scrolls are different from the one that's on the plate. Those scrolls are on the angel's hands that they are bringing are prayer assignments that will be given like those weapons to those for whom it has been prepared. Thank you, wonderful Lord Jesus. Can you all please stand up to your feet? I see some wonderful, highly sanctified saints of God present in our midst right now. Some very powerful, powerful, glorious angelic beings who are in charge of intercessions and prayers, movements are present in our midst right now. Oh, wonderful Lord Jesus, glorious Jesus. I see the spirit of a just man made perfect, the same Jeremiah in our midst right now. Thank you, wonderful Lord Jesus. 
glorious Jesus. Thank you, Father. Oh, how blessed your dear daughters are to be surrounded by this cloud of witnesses. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come on, lift up your holy hands and bless the name of the living God. He is a good God. Open your mouth. Magnify Him. Glorify Him. Bless His holy name. He lives forever and ever. The eternal God. The soon coming great King. The I am that I am. The El Olam. Thank you, wonderful God. Thank you, Lokobaba. Thank you, wonderful God. Thank you, wonderful God. Glorious Lord Jesus. Thank you, wonderful God. Glorious Jesus. Thank you, Holy Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We bow our hearts before you, Lord. We humble our hearts. We humble our spirits. We humble our souls before the great God, Jehovah. We bless your holy name. For you are a good God. Your grace and mercy endures forever and ever. Amen, amen. and amen. Please be seated. So let's guard our hearts in the fear of God and in oneness in the company of this cloud of witnesses and the holy ones who I now miss. Please kindly do not chew gum in the house of God. So the last anointing that we want to study is about Anna. 
Now Anna is a prophetess intercessor. So who is Anna? Luke chapter 2, verses 36 to 38 are the only description, those three scriptures are the only description in the entire Bible about this precious woman called Anna. There was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Panuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Now if you look at these three scriptures, we find seven things mentioned here about Anna. Number one, she is a prophetess. Number two, her father's name is mentioned here. This is very, very strange because it is a typical Bible authors or the language of the Bible where female, mostly female names are avoided and even if they are mentioned, their father's names are never mentioned. But in this particular case, Anna's father's name is mentioned. That his name is Panuel. And even stranger is where she came from. That's the third thing. She belonged to the tribe of Asher. And she was of great age. And she had lived with one husband. No remarriage. No divorce. Seven years from her virginity. Means from the time she got married, she was happily married for seven years. After that, her husband died. And this woman was a widow. So that's how we know that her husband died. And at the time of this writing or her appearance at the temple to dedicate the baby Jesus, she was 84 years old. And from the time she became a widow, she came to the temple and she did not depart from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers. That was her ministry. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord. And the seventh thing that we see about her is she spoke of him to all those who were waiting for redemption. So she kind of preached to all those who are waiting. So these are the seven things we read about Anna. Now what does the name Anna means? It means grace or favor. Now why is Anna's father's name mentioned here? Panuel. The word Panuel means vision of God or face of God. And he is a man who frequently had prophetic encounters and he constantly sought the face of God. This was Panuel's background. And Anna was born in such a family. If she was born in such a family who, who has a father who lived with God, walked with God, and he, their house was an open heaven, and he had prophetic encounters with God, and he constantly sought the face of God, how will such a father bring up his children? In the same way, right? In the same way. And Panuel must have taught his daughter how to seek the face of God. How to live a godly life. 
you know, I have four nephews and two nieces. And my third nephew, when he was born, from day one, he grew up in our house. And uh, he grew up from being a baby to a toddler. So when he became a toddler, he would crawl from his crib. Crib, right? Okay. From his crib, he'll get down and he'll crawl with the milk bottle in his mouth into my room. And I will be, by that time he comes, he wakes up, I have my morning tea and I will be studying the Bible. So he'll come crawling into my room, climb up on the sofa and sit beside me. So while I'm having my cup of tea, he has his bottle of milk. <laughs> and after we are done, then I tell him, let's now read the word. So I carry him and put him on my lap and I made him pronounce word for word each word from starting from Genesis chapter 1 in so he must say in of course not from the English Bible it was from the Indian Bible you know so we went through every, one entire chapter so and he sits very patiently whether he understood or he didn't understand Obviously, I'm sure he didn't understand. But when his mouth was speaking those words, his ears were hearing the scriptures, right? So after reading the one chapter, now it's time to pray. So we kneel down. So I make this little boy kneel down beside me. And after two minutes, he will squat down because his knees can stand. But the uncle will hold him up. Let's kneel down and pray. So I pray for one entire hour standing on my knees. And this boy forced to bend his knees, lift up his hands, and pray. So every day, seven days a week, this was the morning routine. And now he's serving God in full-time ministry. So... When you have such a family lineage, you will be trained and groomed or mentored in like manner. So in the same manner, Anna's father was a man who walked with God. He saw God. He had powerful encounters with God. And obviously, he will train his daughter in the same manner. Why Anna eventually became a prophetess is because of her family background. And that is the reason why her father's name is mentioned there. To give us a family link that it is very, very important to have a godly heritage. Very important to have godly parents. If you have known the Lord, it is your bountiful duty to train up your children in the way of the Lord. You cannot expect them to come to know the Lord in their own way. It is your duty. Because the Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go. And then when he's old, he will not depart from it. So it's your duty to train up the child. The next thing we read is the name Panuel is very similar to the name to the word Peniel found in Genesis chapter 32 verse 30 and Peniel means I have seen God face to face see that is the background about Panuel and Anna became a prophetess because of the prophetic anointing that rested upon the family it passed down And very sadly, she became a very young widow. You know, in those days, in those early days in the Middle East, girls usually get married off after they come to age. So, 
13, 14, when they come to age, they become a, a young woman, that's the time they are married. So probably there are no records there. So it's just my wild guess. Probably she was 13 or 14 years old when she got married and she lived happily ever after only for seven years. And her husband died. We do not know how he died. And she became a young widow at 21 years of age. And from the time she became a widow of 21 years of age, now see, in the Eastern culture, when a young girl gets married, she leaves her father's house and goes to stay with her husband's house. So, now, all links with the maternal homes are now cut. So now you belong to the, your father-in-law's family. Now when the husband dies, that link is cut. So now you become nobody's child. You are no more in that family, you are not in this family, you are in a limbo. So in that state, and Anna being brought up in a godly way. You know, there's something that I discovered today. Why her tribe, Asher, was mentioned. Historical records, biblical historical records say, girls from the Asher tribe are firstly very, very beautiful. Extremely beautiful. And I was very, very surprised when I read that because last year when we conducted the first median conference in India, I had a visitation from, I told you, you know, from Miriam, Deborah and Anna. And when I saw Anna, she looked so young and extremely beautiful. Very youngish looking, about 21, 22. And she was so glorious. And she was so fair and lovely to behold. And then now this afternoon, when I made this research, I was equally shocked to find that women from Asia, among all the other 12 tribes, are extremely beautiful, number one. Number two, they are the most godly ones among the rest of the tribes. Number three, they are the most well brought up girls. And number four, they have a heart to always seek after the things of God. Therefore, Young men from the Levite tribes always choose a girl from the Asher tribe as their future wives. Because of these girls' backgrounds, they best understand the work of a priest. And they willingly cooperate with the husband's priestly duties and also of because of all their godly backgrounds. So this is the reason why even her tribe, Asher, is mentioned in the scriptures. So these are all the heritage of Anna. So being a woman who is very godly, who has godly parents, and a prophet-like father, and being born and brought up in a very, very orthodox, godly, God-fearing family and been brought up in the ways of always seeking God, always waiting in the presence of God. Naturally, when she became a widow, she did not want the pleasures of her family life anymore. And we also know that she didn't have any children. So for seven years of her married life, she had no kids. So after she became a widow, 
she totally surrendered her life to serve God for the rest of her life. Probably, this is my guess, this is no revelation. Maybe her husband was a priest. Maybe. So she decided in one way continue the husband's ministry by being resigned as a recluse or like a monk in the temple and serve God for the rest of her life. This is all about her background. Now I am also going to share with you some revelations I received from her concerning her own life. Some background information. Now Anna encountered, had an encounter with God after she became a widow when she was crying in the temple over her husband's death. So as she was crying and weeping, an angel of God came to her to comfort her. And then an assignment was given to her if she would be willing to be an intercessor to pray for the coming of the Messiah. That was the invitation given to her. Are you willing to offer yourselves for the birthing of the Messiah? Are you willing? Now, because of her background, she did not hesitate to say, Yes, Lord, here I am. And she willingly gave her life to pray. So what did she do? She looked up at the bright-looking angel and received a scroll from him of her calling. And she humbled herself before God, accepting the call, and stayed in a corner in the temple that would directly look at the holy place and then she prayed day and night. That was her place. Far away in one corner where women, uh, women's quarters are. She stayed in a place where she could directly look at the holy place. Though it was closed, but she could at least see because at times when they are open, the curtains are parted, she can have a glimpse of the holy place. And she directed all her prayer towards the holy place, towards the Ark of the Covenant, where God's presence rested. Now, how did she serve God? The Bible tells us she served God with fastings and prayer. That was her call. She was not called to preach. She was not called to go anywhere around the world as a missionary, but she was called to give herself to fasting and to prayer. She served God. Now, it's very interesting to study the word. The word serve in the Greek is letrio, L-A-T-R-E-U-O. And the word letrio means one's extreme devotion service to something he worships it's not just serving but you are extremely devoted 